Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at RIA with a Peabody Sidehammer Rifle and Sidehammer Carbine. There are some military firearms that are fantastic and widely accepted and you know widely known, and there are some that are terribly unsuccessful and not manufactured at all because they stink. And then there's that group in the middle that are actually pretty darn good, and they get some adoption, but maybe not as much as uh, as their quality really suggests that perhaps they should have. And I think the Peabody rifles fall into that third category. So, uh, Henry Peabody was born in Boxford, Massachusetts in 1826. Uh, when he turned 17, he uh, got his first job as a machinist, uh, and really began a lifetime career designing and working on firearms. He would go to work for the Waterford Arsenal uh, in Massachusetts at one point, and eventually by 1862 he was hired as the foreman for the Spencer Rifle Company. Uh, they were starting to make a tremendous number of firearms uh, for the US military during the Civil War. They needed good shop technicians, and he was that. Now, at the same time, uh, Peabody was working on his own design for a tilting breech or a tilting block firearm. This is, in fact, very similar to the Martini Henry, which is the second half of this story, which we're going to save for another time. Um, suffice to say, if you're wondering, like, didn't Martini do that? Yes, he did, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, however, where the Martini Henry, or the Martini rifle, had an internal striker, Peabody used an external hammer, as was the custom at the time. In fact, he used the hammers uh, manufactured by the Spencer Rifle Company. He kept some elements of the design that worked really well. Anyway, um, during the 1860s he started trying to get this—he patented the rifle in 1862, first off, and then he started working on getting his own military adoption. And he went through a couple attempts at getting trials by the US military, and the problem wasn't with the gun. The gun always performed really quite well. In fact, you know, among many other tests, he passed with flying colors, a proof load test of four bullets stacked up in the barrel with a 75 grain powder charge behind them, which the rifle happily fired downrange without any problems. However, he was never quite in the right place at the right time. So like one of his attempts to get the rifle considered, he managed to submit it right before the military was starting to look at adopting a standardized metallic cartridge, which would become the 56 Spencer. And so they're like, well, right now we're not sure on the cartridge, so we don't want to test any carbines. Well, that, that doesn't really help someone like Peabody. At any rate, um, finally by the end of the war he gets the Peabody into a substantial US military trial in 1865 and 1866, and the results come back pretty positive. It's one of the guns that ra ranks the highest in the trial, but the conclusion of the Ordnance Board at that point is, yeah, we're not ready to adopt anything yet. Once again, it's a good gun, wrong time, wrong place, nothing comes of it. Now, uh, Peabody had uh, set up a relationship with the Providence Tool Company to actually do the manufacturing of his gun and to help with its development and trial. And uh, Providence Tool thought there was a lot of potential in this gun, and they started working on foreign military contracts as well. And starting in the mid to late 1860s, they started getting some. Uh, they sold a few rifles to Spain, uh, which were used in the insurrection in Cuba. They sold a few rifles, a couple thousand rifles, to Canadians, well, to the Canadian government. Uh, there was this pesky and somewhat hilarious, you know, 150 years later, uh, Fenian Brotherhood that decided it was, well, it was a bunch of expat Irishmen in the US who decided they were going to go invade Canada, capture it, and then trade it to the British government to get Irish independence. This kind of freaked out the Canadians, and they bought a bunch of guns as a result. They were in a rush, and so one of the things they bought were Peabody rifles. These were some of the early small orders. The thing that really broke it for Peabody was he managed to get a contract for 15,000 rifles for the Swiss government. And this came in the aftermath of the Austro-Prussian War, where the Prussians had their fancy new uh, Dreyse 
uh, breech loading rifles, and the Austrians had old muzzle loaders, and the Austrians got whooped. Uh, and it kind of freaked out a lot of people, a lot of military people worldwide, and the Swiss among them. The Swiss figured, okay, we're going to take all of our old muzzle loaders and we're going to convert them into breech loaders. This was going to be the Milbank Amsler conversion. Uh, however, while we're doing that, we're going to need some more rifles to equip the guys whose guns are getting worked on, so we need to buy something. So they held a trial, offered a big prize, and they determined that the Remington rolling block was the best option, and they tried to buy 15,000 Remington rolling blocks. Remington was unable to meet the terms of the contract at the time. I suspect it was involved mostly delivery times. Uh, the Swiss wanted the guns relatively quickly. And so the Swiss uh, went back to their second choice, which was the Peabody. And so they, uh, Peabody sold 15,000 of his rifles in 41 rimfire to the Swiss. First really big contract. Now, follow that up with a successful sale to the Spanish, um, which I I should kind of mentioned earlier. Well, he starts making the Spanish model of the rifle, and the Spanish are they want their own cartridge, uh, which will become designated the 43 Spanish. Now it appears that there were two separate companies uh, that developed this cartridge at the same time, and what Peabody did is slightly different from the standard 43 Spanish that we recognize today. Uh, they called it 433 Peabody. It seems like it's basically 43 Spanish with a paper patch. But there's this just slight difference um, between it and the standard cartridge. Interestingly, uh, the 43 Spanish was basically based on the French Chassepeau cartridge. Uh, Spanish thought that was a darn defective round and they wanted to copy it. So uh, the, they needed to, Peabody needed to produce, or rather Providence Tool, needed to produce 5,000 guns to finish off their order for Spain. They produced instead 10,000 guns so that they could take the other 5,000 and try to sell them commercially or you know, internationally to anyone who wanted rifles. They wanted to have something in stock to actually deliver. This makes sense. Uh, and this is where they were finally in the right place at the right time. And that is because of the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, the Germans, well the Prussians, uh, handily defeated uh, French armies on a pretty massive scale. And uh, the Napoleon II, or Napoleon III surrendered to uh, the, the Prussian armies. However, the government of Paris was not willing to surrender, and it set up a government of national defense, and there would be a siege of Paris for many months. The government of national defense desperately needed firearms, because all the standard French army weapons had been captured with the French army. Uh, and so they started buying up anything they could get. They actually set up a, a contract with Remington to act as sort of their agent in the US, buying anything and everything they could get their hands on. And they basically gave Peabody an open order. We will take as many guns as you can ship at this, your standard price, until this date. And they kept pushing the date back. And Peabody, well, the Providence Tool Company, uh, just went gangbusters. They figured, like, this is our opportunity to just print money. The more guns we, every gun we can make, we already have an immediate buyer. And the more we make, the more they'll pay us. So they just started cranking out rifles. Um, ultimately, April 22nd, 1871 was the final deadline. And by that time, they produced 32,100 of these. In fact, this is one of those 32,100 uh, for uh, sale to France. And they shipped them off to France. However, the guns didn't end up getting used. Um, as is kind of typical in a lot of these stories, uh, countries in this situation will, will buy a ton of guns, but they won't really have the opportunity to actually put them to use, or sometimes they don't even get delivered successfully. Well, these would end up on the surplus market in Europe not that much later. Anyway, that has been a very long-winded explanation of how we get to this rifle. Um, and in fact, it also is an explanation of how we get the carbine. But we'll talk about that in just a moment when we take a look at these up close. We'll start with the rifle here. This is truly a beautiful gun. It's a really cool opportunity to see how a military rifle of this style would have looked straight out of the factory, because this one has never seen serious action, and it's been well cared for its whole life. And so you can see this really cool case hardening still um, on the hammer and the receiver. Now the way this works is we have an external hammer. This is a Spencer hammer. Uh, as you may recognize. And there is a rimfire firing pin right there on the side of the bolt, the side of the breech, I should say. Uh, 
So there's a half cock and a full cock notch, and we have a lever operating here that drops the breech block. This is very similar to the Martini Henry, which will be a story for another day. There is a single extractor down in the bottom there, and you can actually see that extractor kick back right there when I pull down on the lever. Uh, so that pulls the cartridge out, and you would then drop a new cartridge right in there, close the breech block, cock the hammer, and you're ready to fire. So this is going to drop, hit the firing pin, fire the rifle. In the collecting community, this pattern of rifle is called the Model of 1870, although that was never a Peabody or Providence tool designation. But one of the uh, features of that is this five-line uh, marking on the left side of the receiver. So it's got Peabody's patent and then the manufacturing information. So Providence tool of Providence, Rhode Island. There is a little WC uh, cartouche there that is easily mistaken for a US military proof, but that is in fact a uh, Providence Tool Company inspection proof. So this style of elevator rear sight was used on the 1870, and specifically on the Spanish model, which is what was made for the French. Um, we have 1 to 400, I presume, meters uh, here on the side using this V-notch, and then if you want to uh, shoot farther out to, it looks like 1300 meters, you can lift this elevator up and move the slider up and down. The front sight is a very simple barley corn, and we have a nice big old cleaning rod down there. Um, this is of course in 43 caliber. Uh, these were also made in 45 caliber uh, for Romania. They were made in 50 caliber early on, uh, 50 caliber rim fire for a lot, of, uh, a lot of different attempted contracts and successful contracts. And the one other sort of distinctive feature of the 1870 pattern um, is that it has two barrel bands. So there's one, and then there's our second barrel band, and then we're back at the rear sight. Uh, the earlier 1866 pattern has three barrel bands. One last marking on here, and this is what tells us that this was one of the guns that was sold to France, is this crown over V. That is actually a German provisional proof mark that was introduced uh, to, to use on rifles that were manufactured before 1891 to meet, uh, that, that didn't have conventional proofs uh, when they were manufactured. So this shows us that this gun was on the German surplus market at some point uh, in the significant past. Now we also have the carbine pattern here. This has a number of different features to it. Obviously the shorter barrel has a cut down handguard, and that is the way the factory manufactured them. That's not sporterized. We have a three position uh, sort of L-shaped rear sight here with a 100 yard notch, and then a 300 yard notch at the very bottom of that circle, and a 600 yard V notch at the top of this. Oh, that's sticky with old grease in there, but it will move. So that's how that's used. The carbine is actually chambered for a 50 caliber rim fire cartridge, and it's interesting to note that it has a shorter uh, cartridge slide. If we compare it side by side with the rifle, you can see the difference there. This long version was made for the 43 Spanish cartridge. Typical of carbines at the time, it has a saddle ring uh, on the side that would be used for attaching to a single point sling. This one has a much more uh, legible, prominent uh, WC inspection proof on it, and it has that same five line address mark. So uh, these carbines were manufactured out of all of the leftover parts uh, when Peabody or when Providence Tool stopped making guns for the French. They didn't want to put them to waste, and they figured people might be interested in a carbine version of the gun. So why not make a couple thousand of them and, and see if they sell? Later in 1871, after the conclusion of this uh, rush to manufacture for the French, the Providence Tool Company decided to cut it, well, decided to stop while it was ahead on the side hammer gun. They figured, like, we're probably not going to get a lot more really big uh, purchases for these. They'd been trialed by a whole bunch of different nations in Europe and South America, all over the place. And fundamentally, the problem with this rifle is it was just a little too expensive. It was good, but rifles like the Remington Rolling Block were just as good, and they were simpler, and they were cheaper. And Providence recognized this. Like, you know, we got lucky, we did really well with this French order, but 
that's it. It's time to quit. We don't want to dump all of our profits back into trying to find more buyers for these. So they started blowing out the guns. Where their list price had been like $28 for a rifle, they started offering them for $17, which only conveniently happens to be a dollar less than a Remington rolling block. And they managed to make a number of sales. They sold them to a couple of United States militias. They sold them to Connecticut and Massachusetts for militia use. They sold some to Mexico. They sold some to Columbia. Um, and ultimately they blew out the rest of their inventory to Schuyler, Hartley & Graham, which was a major surplus company in New York. Schuyler, Hartley & Graham would have these guns, especially carbines, uh, lying around for a couple of decades after that. So the carbines in particular, which had all been made up on surplus parts, left over from the French contracts or the French building, um, they got about 2,900 of those carbines initially, Schuyler, Hartley & Graham. They were still selling them at least in 1906. They tried converting some to center fire. Those didn't sell all that much better. It just wasn't a gun that interested a lot of people, and so it stuck around for a long time. And that's part of the reason why we have examples here in the US that are in fantastic mint condition, is because they were some of those guns uh, that were sold commercially and never put through any real hard use. Similarly, a lot of the French guns uh, ended up on the European surplus market without having been ever actually put into use, and so we have a lot of these in really good condition available as well, which is really cool for the collector. I think Peabody is this very interesting niche side of gun development in the 1860s and 1870s that a lot of people aren't, uh, aren't familiar with. Certainly the quality is much better than the lack of recognition would suggest. Now, um, I do want to touch on um, Peabody himself. He's kind of an interesting figure in that he didn't do a whole lot else with firearms, at least not as far as we know. There are not really any good details available about his life after the 1870s, um, but he was not further involved in firearms development. He was never really a businessman or a salesman. That wasn't his thing. That's why he was working with Providence Tools. They could take care of all that hard stuff. And he got to do what he enjoyed, which apparently was collecting violins. Um, that is the one thing that's known about him. He ended up with a Stradivarius as part of his violin collection, lived in Boston until he died in 1903, at which point he had amassed a personal fortune of some $350,000, which is, equates to about $9 million today. Most of that came from the Turkish uh, Peabody Martini contracts, not from these side hammer guns, but like I said, that's a story for another time. Uh, he was a bachelor, lifelong bachelor, never married, never had children. Uh, and interestingly, in his will, he left his entire fortune to open a, to found a girls' school in Norwood, Massachusetts. Uh, his family, his, his brothers, uncles, nieces, uh, weren't too pleased about that. They tried to fight that in court, but in 1904 the will was upheld, and that's where his money went. So I, I like finding examples of, of the guys behind some of these designs who, as far as we can tell, lead very happy and satisfied lives and die comfortably wealthy. There are a lot of examples that are the polar opposite among firearms designers, so it's nice to find some, some good examples. At any rate, hopefully uh, you guys enjoyed the video. Clearly if you're still sticking around at this point, uh, you find the Peabody uh, rifles and carbines and the inventor himself perhaps as interesting as I do, so thanks for watching. Just as a quick postscript, if you're interested in learning more about Peabody, about Peabody rifles and carbines, if you want to skip the wait and find out about the Peabody martinis before I get around to doing a video on them, and certainly if you have any interest in collecting these and want to know about all the different contracts, I would highly recommend checking out the book Peabody Firearms by Edward Hull. This was my primary reference uh, for all the information presented in this video. It is well organized, it's well written, it's an excellent resource on the Peabody. It's utterly boring if you're not interested in Peabody and his firearms, but if you are, this is the go-to source. Thanks.